Uh, uh, I've got it! I've got the moon! Ah, uh, my uh, fellow Americans. Uh, the moon is uh, uh, gone. Uh, we are fucked. Uh, thank you. God bless America. Michelle, make me some corn dogs, you bitch. Say, look at this. I've been cleaning out my nest, and I found an old book of my poetry. The revolution will be televised. Society, within moments of the gets its first fix. Silver light trade in the eyes of the best slide. The first of hundreds of chemicals that will prolong this life and enhance the problem. I don't have to tell you that good drugs do for mankind when properly used. In this case, that's two young Negroes were stopped by California But there is a side of charge to this common driving. knowledge. There was a scuffle. A belief that there is a pill for every purpose. The mother of the two. You know, I've been coming down with a serious case of the Hollywood Blues recently. Don't know what the Hollywood Blues is? Well, uh, it'll make you want to holler sometimes and, uh, throw up both your hands. I know, crazy. The fifth Despicable Me was not good. Everybody knows the fifth installment is always the best, like Jurassic World Fallen Franchise. But Despicable Me 1's reputation is a gem in the doo-doo pile. And I actually agree with it. It's kind of a fine family movie with an actual idea and character development, something not common in Illumination's work. Like, it's surprisingly not just watered-down corporate garbage. However, the scenes where the minions go out and drag it to the grocery store to buy a unicorn gives me anxiety because it's a sign of what is to come. Then we got Despicable Bitch 2, which was a downgrade from the original. It's a detective story that's barely developed or interesting at all, and is resolved way too easily. It's easily the point where the franchise truly found its identity, and that identity is just jokes with no heart, unlike the first movie. And there's nothing wrong with the movie just purely trying to be funny. Like, for example, The Great Muppet Caper, the second MCU movie, which isn't connected to the previous and has no heart unlike the previous, which is fine because it's doing its own thing with the characters. But when it's a direct sequel, unlike The Great Muppet Caper, it's kind of distracting when you remove a significant element. Like, imagine Toy Story 3, but there's no themes. Uh, yeah, nothing like that. Uh, Buzz Lightyear just shits himself the whole movie. After that, we got the Minions movie, which is a disaster on another level. It is a terrible idea for a multitude of reasons, executed terribly for a multitude of reasons. I've already talked about it twice, and not even joking, I could probably make a Minions re-revisited review. I'm not going to, but I could. Then Despicable Bitch 3, a film so devoid of an actual concept that the plot is nothing more than just good guy fight bad guy, but that's only like one third of the actual movie, because there's like a thousand plots. Again, I've gone more in depth on these movies in the past. If you want more thoughts on the previous installments as well as Illumination in general, uh, both their other movies and their artistic integrity, I've already made four other Illumination videos. If you know uh, my Minions opinions, uh, it's nothing just a it's just a peak 10 out of 10 franchise. Be sure to subscribe if you got your first boner while uh, watching the Minions gay stripping scene. But Minions The Rise of Gru, aka Despicable Me, Motherfucking Five, is the reason why I've been coming down with the Hollywood Blues as of recent. In fact, this movie was hyped up for two and a half years. So the film, as previously established, was intended to release in late June to early July, uh, but that didn't happen due to COVID, so it got pushed back one year, and then that one year came, and then it got delayed again, which was very upsetting for the Minion Lover community. One Minion Lover wrote in response to the announcement to the second delay, At Minions, this is a genuine shame. What is the reason for this? Is Illumination trying to maximize their profits as usual? Do they want a huge box office hit at the theaters? If this is the case, I don't think this movie will ever be released. After the pandemic, I think it's safe to say that theaters won't be as appealing anymore. The future is streaming services. Why doesn't this movie release on Peacock? Sure, it'll likely not as receive as much profit if it were released theatrically, but streaming is the future. This is a genuine bummer because I've been looking forward to this movie ever since 2017 when it was initially announced. I don't even want to watch it anymore. It'll be very hard to justify a five-year wait for this movie. It'll probably be an average kid's movie. 
I wonder what will happen to Minion Rush, since they are planning some fun Minions 2 content. <laughs> I won't be surprised if it ends up shutting down. I'm simply upset. This terrible news for a Minion fan such as my- I'm sorry about my rant here. I just simply thought I'd give my perspective on this upsetting announcement. And Martin Luther King Jr. is actually correct here. This movie undeniably had an unnecessary delay to maximize profit. Even if you thought the movie was a 10 out of 10, I think we could all agree that this was delayed to maximize profit rather than delayed to further complete the actual project. The first delay was announced on March 4th, 2020 and set it back a whole year, but the film was initially supposed to come out around July of 2020. Like the previous installments all having July-June releases, family summer movie. So that's about five-ish months until the film was coming out when the first delay was announced. So the film was supposed to come out five-ish months after the marketing began. So I have to assume it had to have been like at least 75% complete, if not 90. In fact, Sing 2, which was planned to release after Minions, got delayed in April 2020. Then it came out in December 2021, making it very clear that Sing 2, obviously being a less of a cash cow, but um, tis. They kind of just used it as a test to see if Illumination could survive in theaters in terms of box office numbers and the ever-changing theater industry. Kind of what, like, Pixar did with Toy Story 4 and Incredibles 2. Toy Story 4 was in development hell, but they still wanted the summer 2018 release, so they just rushed out Incredibles 2. But Sing 2 got released on December 22nd, 2021, which was around the time of Spider-Man No Way Mid, which was record-breaking in terms of its financial success making over a billion dollars in the post-corona vacation era. And keep in mind, Despicable Bitch is a billion dollar franchise with both Minions 1 and Despicable Bitch 3 grossing over one billion. This is impressive for a somewhat new studio to the game. Like, this franchise alone is giving Disney and Pixar's mainstream animated films a run for their money in their entirety, but no way mid proves that films could still make a billion. And Sing 2 released around the same time, which keep in mind, Sing is not a billion dollar franchise. The first one made around 634.2 million, which is like six times its budget, so it was a smash. And the second one made about four times its budget, so it was a success. So with the help of Spooderman Nostalgia Bait and Sing 2's success, it basically secured Minions 2's release for the summer of 2022. And by then, Saturday Night at the Movies was kinda back, kinda. <laughs> One feeling of the Hollywood Blues that you may not recognize, that it could extend the practicality of your own movie theater. This shit hall is in the middle of a city. Check out this traditional box office. It's not really used as a box office anymore. All the shit's digital. It's more of a fucking pin board now. In fact, they still have graphics from Revenge of the Sith, Shrek 3, and Spider-Man 3, all of which came out in 2007 at the latest. Like, some of the shit in here has been standing here since 2007, the same year that Netflix went digital. Hollywood Blues makes you want to holler sometimes and, uh, Throw up both your hands. So risking the release of Minions 2 prior before it had been statistically proven with both movies in general and Illumination to still be viable at the box office. And they didn't want to do a straight to VOD release because that could potentially limit the financial gross. It wasn't theatrically exclusive for very long, but it was still theatrically exclusive for about a month. See, one thing that I kind of hate is that Trolls World Tour and Scoob could go down in the history books because although Trolls 2 got a very limited release in theaters in the United States because this was like less than a month into COVID, at least for my region of the United States, but Trolls World Tour, which primarily was viewed on VOD, and Scoob, originally planned for theaters, got a VOD release as well. This, this proved that mainstream animated films could still be successful on VOD. These total grosses for both of these movies may not seem like a whole lot, but we have to factor in the state of the world when these two films came out, the merchandise sales of both, as well as 
Trolls World Tour's minor theatrical release. But Minions 2 didn't want Scoob or Trolls money. So essentially, what we got was the most unnecessary movie delay in the history of cinema. It was clearly done for the money. Like, not even Disney did that. Fucking Disney. I mean, like, to be fair, Turning Red wouldn't have made any money because it didn't have 9-11 references. Stupid fucking Red Panda not stopping the September 11th terrorist attacks. Yeet! But how was the actual movie? Well, it's not as decent as the first, but it's still mediocre and underdeveloped, like 2 and 3. But I would definitely say it's not as nothing as a movie as the first Minions. So why did Minions The Rise of Gru uh, make my banana hurt? Well, for starters, the title of the movie is a red flag. Minions, The Rise of Gru, as in protagonist, the emphasis on another protagonist. Who is the protagonist? This isn't a title that contains two characters, a protagonist versus antagonist, like Scott Pilgrim versus the world, or the establishment of an antagonist, like Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. Who is the protagonist? This is an incredibly disorganized title, and is a symbol of the unorganized movie to come. In fact, I'd argue disorganization in storytelling is a huge issue with the franchise in general. The mystery in Despicable Bitch 2 is incredibly underdeveloped because they spend the whole movie with scenes that rarely contribute to anything. So when the case is actually cracked, it's not very satisfying of a reveal. Like, the fact that Margot has connections to the main villain is incredibly underused. Tonight will be the night that I will fall for you. The minions are shoved into every scene unnecessarily to both pad out the movie and to have haha -ha funny moments so they can be put on Cheetos. The romance aspect isn't really used to put the pieces together. Bringing up the great Muppet caper again that has a romance subplot as well as a date plot point but that actually gives the characters a clue to cracking the case. So, that plot point actually ends up being purposeful. Yeah, Despicable Bitch 2 is just worse than Great Muppet Caper. Ralph, hand me the blowtorch. Blowtorch? Who said anything about a blowtorch? I got some paper towels! If we look at the first Minions, the second half is a completely different movie, which goes against the point of the previous concept. So much is introduced, then immediately thrown out the window in the next scene. Back at it again at Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Like, why does Bob become the king? That's not the fucking point of the movie. The point of the movie was to find an evil master. You find an evil master, now they're becoming king. And at the end, they get glorified as heroes by all of England, even though they're supposed to be evil. That's a terrible ending. What's the point of going to New York City if they leave immediately? What's the point of the villain family if they leave immediately? Oh, Walter, look! They Adorable little freaks are headed to Orlando, too. Yeah, I see that. Hey, Walter Jr. Why is Gru only in the last scene, etc.? Despicable Bitch 3, they try to give everybody something to do, but it barely contributes to anything. Like I said, one third of the movie is actual plot with nothing more than a good guy fight bad guy heist plot. And it's not like it's conveniently packaged, so each family member getting something to do just kind of ends up pointless in the end. Like, what the fuck does Agnes trying to find a unicorn have to do with anything? You figured this would lead to, like, defeating the villain or whatever, but it doesn't. They just froze Dr. Nefario in Carbonite because they couldn't find anything to do with him for this movie because it's so fucking disorganized. This is supposed to be a movie about a family and you just wrote out one of the family members? Dr. Nefario! So every sequel's narrative is completely fucking broken. And unsurprisingly, Rise of Gru's narrative is completely fucking broken. It's incredibly disorganized. It's more of an anthology of three plots that tie together in the end, but isn't very conveniently packaged. It's packaged, but not in a satisfying way. So instead of jumping back to back, let's just go over each plot individually. 
So this plot is supposed to serve as Groot's backstory of how he became a supervillain, meaning that you would expect it since by the end of the first and the sequels he's a redeemed villain. So we saw him go from bad to good, so you figured a movie called The Rise of Gru would show character progression, and since it's a prequel, you would expect this to show him how he turned from good to bad. When we see Gru lazily shoehorned into the end of the first Minions, he's already a villain, especially described by the narrator who is missing from the second movie, by the way. He was... despicable. But that's not actually a bad reference because it's an actual observation. Because the Minions want to find the most evil master and Gru technically defeated the movie's antagonist, so they just go with Gru instead of the US government. Like, why do they not go to the White House? They see the Nixon billboard. But this finding the most evil master bullshit is completely thrown out the window, which isn't unexpected because it's a complete retcon. In the first movie, it's established that Gru made the minions, which makes a lot more sense. The logic of the retcon is not even continued. It's a retcon of a retcon. Guys, tracked me down and responded to my help wanted ad. I was like, who are these tiny tater tots? But Gru looks up to a team of villains called the Vicious Six, the main antagonist, which there is an unnecessary amount of, being five since one of them is an anti-hero of the movie. The only member that serves any purpose is Bell Bottom, her, 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 and Wild Knuckles, who is not an antagonist. And I hate it when plots overstuff the amount of antagonist. Like, do we need five villains? Spider-Man 3, do we need three villains? Other shitty Spider-Man 3, do we need six villains? Crystallized, do we need seven villains? Don't worry, we'll get to that. The Rise of Gru, it has multiple plots occurring at once. So it could have actually benefited from five villains with each plot having a distinguishable antagonist. And having this many villains isn't a huge deal. The other four are just kind of like side henchmen. So it's not a huge issue, but in context of what it's surrounded by, it's a huge missed opportunity. So I guess the rise of Gru is taking on a large threat rather than a shift in morality. But I'd argue a shift in morality would be far more appropriate because it could expand on previously established concepts. Not that the series gives a shit about continuity, like, at all. Because Young Gru is not a new concept to the franchise. We see this in the Despicable Me movies. And what's established throughout those? His mother does not care about him. He has no father figure. He gets no bitches. He's bald. Which is a silly PG way of displaying trauma, but it's still a logical character development nonetheless. And the fact that it's a kids movie displaying these types of themes isn't a bad thing at all. You know, he doesn't shoot the Kennedys, he just pops balloons. It doesn't need to be dark to get the point across. So anyway, Gru steals the Vicious Six minus one's MacGuffin and now they're after him. So since they kick Wild Knuckles off the villain team, the character conflict is a desire for power rather than being a team, and they barely do anything with this character conflict. So, the Taco Bell, I mean Vicious Shit, are after Gru, and this plot had the opportunity for character development, but barely anything happens. And we actually get to see Wild Knuckles and Gru become friends, and they pull one heist together throughout the whole movie because the relationship is underdeveloped. Hell, there's even a Vector cameo, which makes no sense because he's clearly much younger than Gru in the first movie. Gru's age is actually integral to the character's motivation, being influenced by the 69 moon landings, because this is when they actually gave somewhat of a shit. But this movie is set in 1976, even though at the end of the first one it was 1968, and they call him Gru, but he hasn't Gru. Like, what is he eating? Hell, Dr. Nefario they even brought back for this movie. He gets a cameo, which explains how they met, even though they met in the last movie. But anyway, Wild Knuckles is presumed dead, and he gets a funeral, which is obviously a fake-out death because it's an Illumination movie, and this is supposed to be a sad conclusion to the character, but we barely know the character. In fact, Gru's funeral speech actually acknowledges an issue with the movie. We didn't have much time together. But the time we did have, 
I'm so grateful for. This movie is three plots shoved into 88 minutes. Like, we're supposed to be sad that this character died. We just fucking met him. And of course he's not dead because life is so fucking easy and we have to prepare kids for that. We'll probably just end up killing all of them anyway because they're not mentioned in any other films considering it's a prequel. Like, wait, why the fuck did I say that? I don't think Illumination has ever canonically, officially, on-screen kill the main character before, protagonist or antagonist. And that's the end of this plot, except if you live in China, because the Chinese government censored it, and uh, Wild Knuckles gets imprisoned at the end of the movie, and they reuse frames from Despicable Me 2 to establish that Gru turned good eventually, because I guess they don't want children to question authority. Like, imagine escaping communist China, and you're trying to watch your favorite movie, Minions The Rise of Gru, in America, and you learn your whole childhood was a lie. So, since Gru is being held for ransom and shit, it's up to the minions to save him. So they have to go to San Francisco to get him. Now, why the movie just doesn't open in San Francisco to begin with is filler. Similar how to the first movie, they go to New York, New York, waste a bunch of time dicking off and then steal human clothes from a human clothesline and then leave New York City immediately. In this movie, they steal clothes from a human suitcase and waste time dicking off in a plane to San Francisco. But then, oh no, the year 1997 has arrived. A herd of fucking ugly reds are rushing from the mainland. Crime skyrocketed. Hong Kong is ruined. Therefore, Hong Kong government called Bruce Lee's relative, the Minions. For the massacre of the Reds, the minions are a killer machine. Wipe out 1.2 billion of the Red Communists. Yeah, so out of nowhere, even though the objective was to save Gru, Kevin Stewart and Bob decide that they have to learn Kung Fu for whatever reason, even though their leader is being held for ransom. Yeah, I guess they had to give the protagonist minions something to do in this movie. So this plot just takes a complete detour. And then the rest of the plot is just complete slapstick. Uh, the end. Man, I love watching Stuart the Minion getting kicked in the balls instead of an actual narrative. Why couldn't they do something like It's a Mad 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 World, which is a, a MacGuffin slapstick movie? But at least there's a consistent objective and creativity in the slapstick. <laughs> So, for some fucking reason, there has to be a fourth protagonist minion with the new minion, Otto, who wasn't in the previous movies by the time of Despicable Me, so uh, he probably overdosed on heroin or something. After all, it was the 70s. In fact, if you know your minion's lore, the characters do in fact have names. Kevin Stewart and Bob, the protagonist from Minions 1, were not new characters to the franchise. Why make a new protagonist minion when you could just take a pre-existing minion and give him more focus? Like, why not give more focus to Jerry the Minion? Jerry the Minion is the fucking shit. He deserves an MCU Minion Cinematic Universe movie. I say Minion Cinematic Universe, not Despicable Me Cinematic Universe because Gru actually only has one movie. Not that the Minions are that distinguishable, but still, there is established lore. Hey, look at this how many Minions can you name video from the official Minions channel. That one's not Bob. Bob has homophobia in his eyes. Even they can't tell them apart. Even they fucked up. So Otto loses the MacGuffin and then he gets the MacGuffin from Sexy Biker Man and it's barely a conflict. Like, why not have Otto fight one of the five antagonists? You have five of them. Why not fucking use them? So like I said, it's not the worst of the franchise, but the film is exactly what you'd expect in the absolute worst way possible. It is not a good movie, but it's a good Minions movie, which is not a good thing. I can definitely say the focus on comedy and the tone of the previous sequels is still here. Now, if you don't consider the sequels good, there is no reason to watch this, like, at all. Unless you find the brand of comedy funny, which is a perfectly valid reason. But outside of that one valid reason, there's not much else. But I do think it has the opportunity for improvement more than any other sequels, just expanding on what is at least established in the final product. The previous movie was a period piece for the most part, being a 60s themed movie, but it didn't really do too much to feel distinctly 60s. But unlike the previous mostly 60s setting, this one feels a lot more distinctively 70s. And it truly does feel like a comically 70s adventure. 
adventure. Sure, it exaggerates the culture a little bit. It really did use the 70s color palette to its benefit. Illumination's general art style may have some serious flaws, but the color palette is usually decent, and I really like the color palette for this movie. It enhances the 70s feel. The Lorax and the Grinch are fucking awful, but they really do a good job of using a Dr. Seuss illustration color palette, and that benefit is continued here. Additionally, the film has plenty of Chinese imagery, which is a really fun blend with the vintage American imagery. Now, it's obvious the movie is just pandering to China. It's praising China so it can get legally released in China. After all, it wouldn't be possible to wipe out 1.2 billion of the Red Communists without that 1.2 billion potential customers. So yeah, the morality is kind of pandering, but the imagery isn't bad. I like how it's willing to be bilingual with the sound by even making a Chinese cover of Bang Bang My Baby Shot Me Down. I wish more of the stylized elements with the Chinese imagery were present throughout the whole movie. Like, they do some kind of creative martial arts stuff. I kind of wish every fight in the movie was presented like this. That would be a huge game changer. In fact, it's the best animation in the series yet, which isn't saying much because it's not a drastic shift. It never really feels like they're truly kicking it up a notch and evolve the art style. Like, there's some evolution. I think the minions look significantly more expressive, and the backgrounds are significantly approved, especially during the chase scenes. But like, this is the fifth installment, and the art style hasn't changed that much. It's like, it's nothing groundbreaking, it's the best in the series as it should be. Like, it does a couple new things, but nothing about the animation really justifies fifth the movie. Like, Puss in Boots 2 was the first installment in a franchise for over a decade, and technically the sixth movie, but it justifies itself as a sixth installment and a comeback installment, because they took an extra step to find a way to truly crank it up a notch, which makes the film's existence much more justifiable. So yeah, the animation, for the most part, is fine, but it's the fifth movie. Why only be fine? It does some unique things, there's some minor improvements to the art style, but like, there should be so much more than that. Again, the film is what you'd expect in the worst way possible, and that extends to the visuals. Another redeeming quality is the music. Now, Illumination is no stranger to large amounts of licensed music because they can afford it in their movies. I am Harvey Dent and my face is dead. It is often the most generic, overplayed, licensed songs in movies that we all know. It's to please the audience. The Sing series has a bajillion licensed songs in it for a reason. Fruit Loops make me poo poo. <laughs> But for this movie, they actually decided to make original covers of 70 songs for the movies, as well as one original song. And it is interesting that they took the extra step to make covers, and that's somewhat commendable. The licensed music isn't used amazingly or anything, it's just there to sell a soundtrack, but it's not a horrible addition. And like I previously mentioned, I did like how they were willing to be bilingual with the Chinese cover of Bang Bang My Baby Shot Me Down, as well as including an alternate English version for the English audience on the soundtrack. Of course, your own music taste may affect the enjoyment of the soundtrack. The only artist featured that I am personally familiar with as of now are Diana Ross, Tame Impala, and Thunder. Thundercat. So obviously Thundercat's contribution covering Steve Miller band Fly Like an Eagle was the highlight for me because I like both of those artists. But like I said, the music isn't used very sparingly that really elevates the narrative. It's just kind of generic 70s song choices. Keep in mind, the 70s was like one of the horniest decades, so they're kind of limited to what they could thematically put in a kid's movie. Lord have mercy. So some of the 70s song choices are kind of overplayed. There's a cover of Funky Town in the movie, possibly one of the most overplayed 70s songs to establish a setting. I think we all have those songs that we just associate with movies because of how sparingly they were used in a movie and therefore are forever synonymous with our own biases. But I don't think anyone is actually ever gonna hear Funky Town and be like, oh shit, Minions, The Rise of Gru, because that's been in everything. No, tally the entry code. For what? Oh my god, guys, they're playing the Minions 2 soundtrack. So the soundtrack isn't an amazing addition or anything, but it's a decent addition. I will not deny there are some bops on the soundtrack. So in conclusion, I expected improvement just on the basis of Gru having a more prominent role in this movie and, you know, 
Gru can speak fucking English, so they can do more with this character. In fact, I'd even call this movie the second best movie of the franchise. Surprisingly. But this is not a compliment whatsoever when your best movie is like a 7 out of 10 at best. I would definitely say it's more of a clusterfuck than Despicable Bitch 2 and 3. I'd argue, but to the narrative disaster, there is more substance. It's nowhere near as flawed as Minions 1, which I've established is a terrible concept executed terribly. But obviously it's not as decent as Despicable Me 1, so it's actually the second best movie of the franchise, which is not saying anything. And of course, Despicable Me 4 is already in development. I believe it was even announced before Minions The Rise of Gru was even out. I assume we will get a Despicable Me, then Minions movie alternating back to back every three years until they stop making money, which doesn't seem to be anytime soon, so this franchise will be milked to death undeniably. If the 2000s had Ice Age, then the 2010s and possibly even 2020s had Despicable Bitch. I do hope they take advantage of the historical settings, having Minions 3 being set in the 80s, Minions 4 in the 90s, etc. So yeah, I could definitely say Minions The Rise of Gru made my banana hurt. In other words, that electronic, electronic, electronic bombardment of images and messages and selling different over and over to ease the pain of different kinds of brutality. One for who is your a number of brutality is to kill your one appetite of the most successful or step in Los Angeles. Today's is a Negro, Leo Brenton.